Um, all right. So uh, last time we discussed uh, how the biological can become social, in part by uh, reviewing some findings from behavior genetics. So we talked a little bit about one way that biological phenomena can be instantiated in the social realm, specifically how our genes might live and help and partially determine diverse sorts of behaviors. But mostly, in fact, last time we focused on the opposite direction, how the social can become biological. And we highlighted a couple of things. One was how culture can shape genes, uh, the genes that we have, the variants, the genetic variants we have, the allelic variants, across evolutionary time over long time horizons. And we talked a little bit about how culture, specifically our environment, can shape the expression and the effect of genes in individuals and in populations. So the gene by environment interaction idea that whether or not you express a certain gene might depend in part on the kind of environment uh, that you are exposed to and whether or not that environment has certain effects on you might depend on the uh, kind of genes uh, that you have. So one idea we alluded to in that department like a few, many lectures ago now that I'd like to return to because probably at the time it just blew by you, we talked a little bit about how, uh, I think we talked about how the, uh, the consequences of taxation for cigarettes might depend on your genes. So let's say, for example, that you're the kind of person who has nicotine addiction. You're the kind of person who was born uh, with a particular propensity to uh, really be um, uh, addicted to tobacco, to uh, nicotine. Well, if you tax cigarettes, on whom will the burden of taxation fall the greatest? On those individuals who have the misfortune of being uh, born with genes that predispose them to nicotine addiction. Right? Those people, no matter how much you raise the, their demand for tobacco will be inelastic. No matter how much you raise the taxes on tobacco, they're going to have to buy the tobacco to feed their addiction. So there's another kind of unfairness you see that might arise from an interplay between the social and the natural lottery, or the, or the natural lottery and social phenomena in this case, because you're just assigned these genes that make you unable to resist tobacco, and now we ratchet up the price trying to drive down the average tobacco consumption, which we successfully do with taxation. Taxation is a really powerful way of implementing social policy. But that burden is unequally distributed. And here, not unequally distributed with respect to, let's say, education or, or race or any of the other variables that we've also been discussing, but now unequally distributed with respect to the genetic predilections of the individuals. That would be a gene by environment interaction. The impact of the environmental policy, the taxation policy, would depend on what kind of genes you have. If you have certain kinds of allelic variants of genes, you would be more responsive to the policy or less responsive to the policy. Do you see what I mean? So it kind of goes both ways. Whether the genes have their effects depends on the environment, and whether the environment has its effect depends on the genes. That's what we mean when we say gene by environment interaction. Now today we're going to be talking about the third thing that we introduced the last time. We're going to consider this third topic, uh, namely uh, or regarding how the social can become biological in yet another way over very short time periods uh, within individuals, not by changing our genome, but rather by affecting how our genome is expressed and how it's expressed, for example, in different cells within uh, our bodies. And the regulation of the expression of our genes and variation across individuals in how our genes are expressed falls to a set of processes known as epigenetic effects. And epigenetic effects do not just apply with respect to social phenomena. They're a general biological principle. But the way we're discussing them today has to do with social epigenetics, how social factors regulate the expression of our genome. Of course, biological and physical factors could also regulate the expression of our genome. But today we're talking about how social exposures regulate our genome. Because in fact, these types of social exposures and the expression of our genes may actually also be under some kind of social regulation. And there are three main classes of the epigenetic regulation of our genes. The first is the DNA methylation, the methylation of specific locations or specific loci within the genome. You have a long strand of DNA, and, uh, and here's the strand of DNA. And, and the particular loci, particular base pairs, might be methylated. Here's a little methyl group here, 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 and so forth. That's one mechanism by which whether or not the gene is red, for instance, depends on whether there's a little methyl group 
sticking out in, in another specific location in a way that will become clear in a moment. It may also relate to, as you remember from your high school biology, raise your hands if you took high school biology. Raise your hands if you did not. A few of you got to Yale without taking high school biology. Have you taken biology since you got here? Yes? Good. Okay. So uh, that's good. It's part of a necessary part of a broad education, to at least obtain at some point. Anyway, as you may remember, there's the DNA, and the DNA is coiled around itself, and then those coils, it's like, raise your hands if you've ever played like twisting rubber bands. You took a rubber band, and then you twisted it, and then the twists turn upon the twists. You remember that feeling? Remember how when, you're, when you take the rubber band and you start twisting it, initially the rubber band coils, and then at some point, the coils coil upon themselves, right? And all of a sudden, it just, it's just like a phase transition. It kind of suddenly coils upon itself when the torque gets too big. That's what happens with DNA. The DNA twists, and then it twists upon itself. That's what's happening here. And then those twists become so twisty that our body has a whole set of special proteins called histone proteins that the twists are twisted around right here. And then all of that stuff twists even more upon itself and that's what makes chromosomes, which are twisted upon twisted upon twisted strands of DNA plus histone proteins and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay? The second mechanism by which the expression of genes could be regulated has to do with histone escalation, which is now these are the acetyl groups that have been added to the histones. And adding those groups also regulates whether or not certain genes are expressed. We'll come back to that. These are the three biological mechanisms. And the fourth, has, fourth I'm sorry, the third has to do with something we will not be discussing, which is microRNA and RNA silencing. And there's only so much biology I can do in this class. If you're really interested in these things, there's a whole other department so you can study them. So this all has to do not with the sequence of bases in your DNA and allelic variation, but rather with how active or inactive the genes are. And these processes are operating within your body to upregulate the expression of certain genes, for example, in your white cells, but your white, your white blood cells that fight infection, but those genes don't need to be turned on in your pancreatic cells. Their different genes are turned on, and the, cells, the, the genes that were activated in your white blood cells might be turned off, let's say, in your uh, pancreatic cells, okay, your islet cells producing insulin or something. Right? So your whole body, different parts of your body have different genes that are sort of turned on or off, and now what we're going to show is that across individuals, different social exposures may up or down regulate using some of these biological principles, primarily we're going to talk about DNA methylation, can activate or deactivate certain genes within your body. Because recent work is opening up this remarkable way that our social environment may be in conversation with our genes and begging whole new questions. So this area is under very active research right now at labs around the world, literally in the last 10 years, with every month new discoveries being made, some of which I'll summarize uh, today. And our exposure to, such fa to factors such as these may affect our biology in possibly adaptive ways by regulating the expression of our genes. So what are some social factors that might affect our epigenome? How might different sorts of social exposures get biologized? How might they literally get under our skin to regulate a set of biological processes within us? and regulate them now specifically at the genetic level. We previously talked about how social exposures affect your cardiovascular risk, plaque buildup in your arteries, uh, immune function. We you know, periodically talk about different things. Now we're going to an even deeper level and ask them, okay, how is the expression of your DNA, which genes are turned on or off, depend on social exposures? And the social exposures can be very diverse. They can involve poverty, for example, or starvation, the kind of body you need you, who are born with the body you have and the DNA you have, if you live out your life in an environment of poverty or starvation, you need a different kind of body with different genes turned on and off than the same you <laughs> born into or living in a different kind of environment. Poverty, starvation, parental care or abuse, I should put here warfare. People born, for example, in, in Gaza or in Afghanistan have different, need different bodies, or Syria need different bodies than people that are otherwise identical people born, for example, in Washington, D.C. Parental care or abuse, family size, language of volume and complexity, the amount of stimulation you get when you're a newborn, how much your parents talk to you, how complicated that language is, also may have some impact on which genes are turned on uh, or off. Education, something known as the operational sex ratio, which is a really interesting idea, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but basically the operational sex ratio is 
the sex ratio when it really matters, that is, when you're trying to have sex. So we can talk about the sex ratio at birth, which is important, and there was actually just a landmark paper just published in, the, in PNAS two weeks ago, totally revisiting sex ratios at birth. But actually, we can also compute the sex ratio at your age, and that's the age that really matters. We don't really care about the sex ratio among 80-year-olds. They're not having sex with, well, they are having sex with each other, but they're not reproducing. And we don't really care, they are actually, it's amazing. 80-year-olds have a lot of sex, actually, but uh, 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 and we're not, we don't care about the sex among babies, right? But we really care about, you know, 20-year-olds having sex, and it's not just because people have an interest in the topic. We care about it because that's what uh, uh, fosters reproduction in our species. So the operational sex ratio is the sex ratio when an organism is at the stage of its life when it's sexually active. So that operational sex ratio may also regulate your genes, the kind of body you need if you're a man and there are 100, women, 100 men for every women, woman, is very different than the kind of body you need if you're a man and there are 100 women for every man, right? Different social environment could affect the kind of body that you need and the expression of genes within you in ways we'll talk about in just a moment. And of course, the neighborhood in which you live, the kind of geographic surroundings, also could have different kinds of effects. Now, what is more and distinct from the ideas that I just put on the table is these epigenetic processes may leave long-time marks. So a second idea is not just that your genes turn on and off depending on the social environment that you might be in, but in addition to that, they might turn on and sort of stay on for the rest of your life, or stay off for the rest of your life. That's a different idea. And the reason that's important is that means a child born into poverty or abused may acquire a different body and then keep it forever. So that no amount of subsequent effort you're born into poverty, but you become wealthy as an adult, it's too late. You have a body that was shaped by the poverty experiences you had as a small child. And that is a different idea than the claim that your social environment uh, could affect you. And in fact, this doesn't just apply obviously to poverty, but also to starvation, abuse, uh, and so forth. One study scanned the entire genome and found that whereas 5% of differentially expressed genes could be attributed to differences in sex and ethnicity, unsurprisingly, for example, the men in this room express different genes on average than the women in this room, but just 5% of the genes, 50% of differently expressed genes could be attributed to whether the subject lived in an urban or rural environment, right? So the kind of body you acquire, the kind of genes, body is too strong a word in this sort of sentence, but the kind of genes or the nature of the genes that you express or turn on, differentially express, turn on or on, may depend much more on whether you are in, a poor, in an urban or a rural environment than with, even than whether you're a man or a woman, which is really astonishing if you pause to think about it. Now, some key work on this idea uh, has been done by a couple of scientists by the name of uh, Meany and Ziff. Now, I, I had actually gone, long ago I realized in my career, I periodically be invited to give talks. And like early in my career, it wasn't that I was cocky, it's that I was busy. I would go and I would be invited to give a talk somewhere and I would come and, you know, my talk was scheduled from two to three. So I'd come and I'd give my talk, I'd do my best, and then I'd leave. And sort of in the midpoint of my career, I realized that actually if I was going someplace to give a talk and other people were giving a talk, it might be efficient to just stick around and see what they had to say, because you never knew. And most of the time, it was totally uninteresting and irrelevant to me. <laughs> uh, but once in a while, it was really unbelievable. And about five or ten years ago, I went to NIH to give a talk about the work that we were doing in my lab, and the guy right before me was this guy, Moshe Zay. <coughs> And I was, it was like those, you, know, you ever seen those ads where the, where the young person is sitting in front of those big speakers and he's being blown backwards and the tie is going this way and hair, you know what I'm talking about? You know? Anyway. Uh, maybe because you guys don't have big speakers anymore. But, uh, so, you know, I was just like, wow! I looked at this guy and I couldn't believe the work that he presented. I'm going to present you a tiny fraction of the work he's done, but it completely changed my way of thinking about so many of the things that I've been talking to you about in this class. Anyway, what, 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 what Ziff's lab has been doing is looking, using a rat model, and also doing some work with humans, looking at how social exposures affect uh, the genetic expression. Now, to start to set this up, you need to understand a few things about rats, and one of the important things about rats is that you can sort of quantify how much a mommy rat loves a baby rat 
uh, or its maternal behavior by the extent to which she licks and grooms uh, her pups. So here are two mommy rats, and, uh, and this is a kind of a, uh, 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 which ones are the nice ones? I can't remember. I think this is a nice mommy, and this is a bad mommy. So this mommy is like, you know, moving its rats around and licking its rats and grooming its rats. And this one is sort of neglecting her rats. It's not like really making her body available for them to suckle. It's sort of standing off from them uh, and so forth. So you can, you can look at a, 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 a rat in a confinement, in a cage, and you can quantify observationally whether this rat is doing the kinds of things that a maternal rat should be doing optimally for the, for the offspring. For example, licking uh, and grooming them. And unsurprisingly, like most biological traits, there's a kind of quasi-Gaussian distribution of these traits. Some rats are very good at this, some are not so good, and most are in between. And you can look at quantify sort of dams is a is a uh, is a, one of those crazy words that we have in our language for uh, you know like it's like a, a congress of geese or no a, a gaggle of geese and a congress of owls and I forgot which you know there are all these crazy words we have for different kinds of groups of animals and different kinds of you know uh, a vixen is a female fox anyway a dam is a is a uh, is a maternal uh, rat. This is the number of dams in a population and the percent that, uh, you know, of, that evince the maternal linking and grooming behavior, and there's some kind of distribution. These are the ones that are really excellent, you know, dams, and these are the ones that are not so good, and most are sort of in between. And this maternal care, not implausibly, affects the regulation of the glucocorticoid pathway, which we also discussed earlier in the course, the sort of stress hormone pathway. So if the, if, I don't need to anthropomorphize this too much, but it's just so much easier to use these terms, so please don't misconstrue me. But if the mommy rat is licking and grooming the baby rats more, then that rat, the baby rat, is like less stressed, right? It feels differently about its environment, and it responds by regulating its glucocorticoid stress hormone pathway uh, differently. For example, rats that neglect their young and that do not lick or groom them result in pups that have increased hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor expression. Those rats that are neglected, are, there's, something's going on. She's not around, I'm not getting the food I need, it's dangerous, I might be predating. I upregulate my glucocorticoid receptors. I have a stress response that's very consistently preserved across many mammalian, many mammalian species. So gene promoter regions that are methylated more or less permanently and differently under the two conditions affecting the amount of glucocorticoid receptor expression in the pups as a result of the social exposure uh, in the dam. So what happens is, is that, yeah, so here is the, uh, the high licking and grooming rat that is taking better care of its, uh, its uh, pups. And, uh, and here's the promoter region for a receptor, I'm sorry, here's the gene that codes for a glucocorticoid receptor. This is a receptor in the brain and in other parts of the body that responds to stress hormone. And when you upregulate, when you make more of it, you have a more heightened stress response. Here, it's not methylated. This, and this is the promoter region. So usually for many genes, typically upstream from the gene, there's a kind of on-off switch for the gene. And that gene regulates whether this transcription of the, of the DNA further down on the strand. Here, because the mother is taking better care of the pups, there's no methylation that takes place. You have upregulation of glucocorticoid receptor expression. And you have low corticosteroid levels, lower anxiety, and high licking uh, or grooming. <coughs> I'm sorry, so that these pups go on to themselves be high licking or grooming pups. They take better care of their offspring because of the care they were taking of. Conversely, and I probably should have started with this example, in the low licking and grooming situation in which the mother is neglecting her pups, you get methyl groups here shown in M that, that bond or bind to the promoter region. And in binding to the promoter region, they downregulate or prevent transcription of the DNA, and so you have decreased glucocorticoid expression, receptor expression, which leads to high cortisone levels because now your brain isn't responding to the to your, your lower amounts of receptor, so you start pumping out more of the hormone to try to get the intended effect, and now your body has high anxiety, and then you go on to express low licking of grooming. The precise details of up or down are not what's important here. What's important is the recognition that something about how the mother treats the baby results in methylation in specific loci within the DNA that then results in the kind of body that the baby has, right? A body that expresses a lot of this receptor or not a lot of this receptor. 
And cross-fostering experiments have shown that this is not genetic. What's happening here is not that we have a kind of rat that takes good care of its young, and then that rat produces more offspring in the F2 generation that have taken kind of care of their young. It's not like you have one kind of genes, and in your family you take good care of offspring and that cascades down generations, and you have a different kind of allele which takes bad care of its offspring and so forth. No, that's not what's happening. We know that it's happening after the DNA because we can do cross-fostering experiments where we take these pups born of this dam and transfer them to this mom. So now they are being poorly cared for by their foster mother, and then they express this pathway. So we can do experiments that convince us that are very certainly persuasive that actually what's happening is not genetic transmission, but epigenetic control uh, in this uh, situation. And there's also, it turns out, a structural change in the brain that's observed that correlates with this change in epigenetic control. So for example, I just told you that one of the things that happens is the amount of a receptor is up or down regulated, depending on how your mother uh, rat uh, treated you. Well, it's not just the amount of receptor that changes, the actual dendritic branching pattern, the, the shape of the neurons in the rat's brain also changes. So they can then sacrifice the rats and examine the brain under the microscope and look at specific neurons and see how your mother treats you if you're a rat, and by extension if you're a human, reshapes the pattern of branching in your brains independent of the actual DNA that you have. So for example here, this looks at the length of dendrites in hippocampus uh, is related to treatment in first postnatal week by low licking and grooming and high licking and grooming. So in low licking and grooming, you get you know, more branching in the apical regions and it looks like less in the basal regions. And you get the reverse over here in the high licking and grooming uh, situation. Now in humans, this initial work, some initial work is validating some of these ideas. For instance, the study of suicide victims who had suffered abuse when they were young, suicide victims who had not suffered abuse when they were young, and controls who died not by suicide showed similar patterns in their brains once their brains were examined uh, compared uh, to the rats. And abused suicide victims had much lower glucocorticoid receptor expression in various tissues than non-abused suicide victims uh, or controls. So if we then go to humans and look at it, now of course in humans we can't do experiments where we experimentally manipulate whether they're abused by their parents, so we have to rely on kind of natural thing, observational studies which have all kinds of other issues, but the human data correlates very nicely with the rat model uh, data that I just told you. So this raises two important points. First, we carry with us biologically records of the world we've experienced before. And second, we might actually transmit this into kind of neo-Lamarckian inheritance. So those ideas that you learned about in high school biology where you were talking about, you know, there was Lamarck and there was Darwin and Lamarck thought there could be, you know, a transmission of acquired traits and ha ha ha, he was all wrong, Darwin was right. That's all true. But it turns out that there is a mechanism by which you can have a kind of Lamarckian inheritance via these epigenetic mechanisms that scientists are actively researching today and that I'm introducing these days and that I'm introducing to you uh, today. Because if you're, you were uh, subjected to a low licking and grooming parent, it reshapes your brain and you go on to then be a low licking and grooming parent yourself. And if I cross foster you, then you don't. So then there's a cascade across generations of this uh, behavior now transmitted socio-epigenetically rather than uh, genetically, or rather than merely socially. So for example, if you were raised in a famine, or under a violent state, or were abused, or faced lopsided sex ratios, your body may change in ways that affects how you raise your own children, not just how your own body is. And in fact, this makes sense. If you think about it from the macroevolutionary point of view, we mammals, should, and not just mammals, many animals, not just in the mammalia, class mammalia, but we mammals should actually have evolved the capacity to be in conversation with our environment. The epigenome is a biological mechanism that serves as a medium for adapting the genome to altered environments it may face early in life. So the argument is, actually, 
If you are born into a world that doesn't have much food, early in life your body should change so that you can have more likely to live out your life and survive in a world of food scarcity. And the same genes should be different if you were born into a world where food was plentiful. It makes sense that we would have this capacity, that we would have evolved to have the capacity to respond, to have our genes be in conversation with the environment. And if your early life experience, experience is one of hunger and danger, you need a different kind of body to cope with it than it was one of satiety and safety. Now this, in turn, raises all kinds of amazing and also troubling questions about the impact of social policies and the intergenerational transmission of disadvantage in our society. So maybe it's not just social, maybe the, 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 the people who abuse their children who are abused themselves, it's not just that they learned to be abusive or that they you know, suffered in some way, all of which is true, but maybe in addition, there's a, something deeper happening in them that causes an intergenerational transmission of these social traits that have been acquired. Which then suggests that if we change the society, we change the people. We change the kind of people that we have, not just macroevolutionarily, like we invent domestication of our cattle, and then we get different ones of us in the future, but over short time uh, horizons uh, as well. Now, you can actually practice this yourself at a website. Uh, there's a website uh, called uh, lickmyrats.com. What is it called? Yeah, it's, I'm sorry, you Google lick your rats. Uh, it's at Utah, the University of Utah. Uh, there's a little game that you can go there, you can play, and you can be assigned. Uh, uh, here we go. It says lick a rat cup, which sounds like a really fun thing to do. Uh, and, uh, and then investigate what happens, and you can experimentally uh, play with this and learn about epigenetics. It's kind of a fun way to while away half an hour, not now, uh, in, uh, in, uh, if you want to understand a little bit about how this goes. So we're uh, one place where nurture, so maternal behavior is one place where nurture meets nature. And finally, here's one other speculative epigenetic effect. This is drawn from some work that we did a few years ago. It turns out, <clears throat> It's very stressful to be the supernumerary sex, to be the sex of which there's more of you, especially for men. And the operational sex ratio is the ratio of males to females, or the fraction of males at sexual maturity. And here on the left, we plot mortality after high school for men, uh, and school level sex ratios in the 1957 graduating high school class for the state of Wisconsin. So we looked at 4,000 men, about a third of all men graduating from high schools in Wisconsin in 1957, and we went to their high school graduating classes and we said, How may, what was the sex ratio in your high school? So raise your hands if you went to an all boys school, high school, all girls school, and in between the rest of you, okay, a high school. And now it turns out it sucks to go to a same sex school for many reasons. Uh, <laughs> actually quite a few, but anyway. Uh, uh, now, those of you that went to same uh, mixed gender schools, not all of your schools was there a 50%, 50-50 boy-girl ratio. Sometimes by chance there was some variation. We excluded the tails of the distribution. We took out all the people that went to either all-boy or all-girl schools, and we looked at the middle of the distribution, and we looked at, okay, by chance you were a boy that went to a school that had 55% boys and 45% girls or by chance you were a girl who went to a school that had 55% boys and 45% girls, or whatever it was. And we looked at how the sex ratio of the high school that you went to, the operational sex ratio, was associated with your hazard rate of death, your likelihood of dying, 50 years later. And we found that actually whether or not you die as an older person still bears a mark for the sex ratio of the high school that you faced when you graduated from high school. Because your body is changing during, remember you learned all this about puberty, how your body's changing? Uh, your body is changing at that stage of your life. And, uh, and your body is internalizing its environment. And a key thing that you're internalizing when you're coming to sexual maturity is what are the sexual opportunities out there? And you need a different kind of body, we believe, if you are more, many more boys than girls, or many more girls than boys, but especially, it turns out it affects the boys' bodies uh, than the girls' bodies. So we find this effect uh, in this situation, and I'm trying to remember, I can't remember right now in this sample what the size of the effect was, but I think it was like an order of three months. Men live about three months shorter lives if they are the supernumerary sex uh, during the time that you're computing the operational sex ratio. 
We repeated those analyses in a completely different data set. Here now looking at a, a sample of nearly 8 million men uh, from around the country. And we looked at the operational sex ratio that, that they faced at the year that they turned, let's say, 18, and then the state that they did so. And again, we plotted the hazard ratio of death versus the operational sex ratio. And once again, there's a rising risk of death in men. The more, um, the more boys there are here, it's 52% boys and 48% girls. Uh, that slight difference of 4% excess boys affects the uh, hazard of death. Now, there are a number of implications, actually, of this. Uh, and, and we believe, or we speculate, that one of the mechanisms by which this might be working is through modifications of, um, of gene expression. Now, right now, there's a number of problems around the world, especially in China and India, with very lopsided uh, sex ratios at birth. As, uh, as you guys uh, probably know, and this is because of the horrible practice of, of uh, neglect of female children, and even more, uh, of, uh, and of female infanticide, but even more of preferential abortion of uh, female babies. And if you go to India, you'll see like billboards that say, you know, better to pay, you know, 2,000 rupees now than 200,000 rupees later. That is, better to pay 2,000 rupees and have a ultrasound and see that you have a female baby and abort the baby than have to pay a dowry for the baby you know, when she grows up and has to get married. And the same kind of thing happens in China. And in fact, they are driven in part by other things like the um, certain cultural norms plus the one-child policy. And you have regions of India and China where the sex ratio at birth is like 1.2 to 1. And then one, about 20% more boys than girls. And the, and the sex ratio is ordinarily, naturally, about 1.04. More boys and girls, slightly more boys and girls are born, but throughout life, boys die at higher rates than girls, and that kind of crosses over in midlife, and by the end of life, you have more women alive than men. Because men are always are the more fragile sex, men die at greater rates uh, than women uh, throughout life, beginning uh, at birth. And, uh, and a lot of people have been looking at these data and thinking about the geopolitical consequences of these sex ratios. Because when these men reach maturity, they're much easier to radicalize. They're more violent. They engage in warfare. They don't have access to the civilizing effect of having a, a partner. And I don't, do not mean any of this in a heteronormative way, by the way. I'm just describing a kind of state of affairs. And so it's, you see that in areas where you have higher males to women, you have higher incidents of terrorism, higher rates of violence, more assault and rape. You see all kinds of terrible things arising, it is claimed, and I think it's true, because of this imbalanced sex ratio. Now, what's interesting about a lot of those things is that people and, they, and people have looked at, oh, you know, how women suffer under that regime, and they do, they absolutely suffer, but it's difficult to persuade policymakers that they should care about women in a lot of the developing world. It just boils my blood, uh, that phenomenon, the kind of misogyny and the neglect of women in so many parts of the world. But what these results suggest is that the men are also being harmed by this. The men are losing life because of the sex ratio. So this gives you a different policy lever, this science, to go to these places and say, this policy actually is harming the men too, not just the women, you see? Now, I don't think it should be necessary to base the policy on this, but what these results suggest is that actually life is being sh could be shortened in those areas as a result of the preferential abortion of uh, female babies. The men are having months of life shaved from their life, and not just due to violence, but due to a number of epigenetic effects that may be occurring at this point in life. Is that example clear? Again, the idea here is critical periods of development. We talked about you know, the neonatal period, now we talked about uh, puberty. Critical periods of development coupled with social exposures that then are internalized, the body is sensitive to what it's seeing, and then you have preferential switching on and off of various genes that give you a body that's equipped to cope with a kind of, here we're focusing on social, but it doesn't just need to be social, it could be biological and physical environment that you face. And now for a third idea, okay? These epigenetic marks can even be transmitted across generations. I'm sorry, now for a second idea, can even be, I'm sorry, now for a third idea. So the first idea is your body responds to the social environment. The second idea, and I'll summarize this in a moment, is that it's quasi-permanent in your own lifetime. Right? You graduate from a high school in which there are many boys and girls. It marks your body, and you carry that with you for the rest of your life to the point where you're more likely to die later in life. Now for the third idea, you can even transmit this to your offspring, which we also introduced a moment ago. And you can have this kind of neo-Lamarckian transmission. 
One very recent study showed that when mice are taught to fear an odor, both their offspring and their grandchildren are born fearing it. And the gene for an olfactory receptor activated by the odor is specifically demethylated in the germline, and apparently and consequently the olfactory circuits for detecting the odor are enhanced in a way that lasts across generations. Nobody knows how this happens. Because during meiosis, the DNA is supposed to be stripped of all the methyl tags. So we don't really understand how this is happening. But very detailed experiments suggest the following kind of thing. You take this rat, you shock it whenever you expose it to a particular odor, and it seems to result in methylation within sperm cells. Here are the methyl tags. Then you mate it in the F0 generation with this, this uh, offspring rat, produces this offspring rat. And when you startle it, I'm sorry, when you, when you, when you uh, uh, press the, uh, the, when you expose it to the same odor, it's afraid of that odor. You can test and detect that it's also afraid of the odor, that its parent was trained to fear. And in fact, it lasts to the F2 generation. Again, a, an amazing, um, uh, actually this graph, the, the work wasn't done by Moshe Ziff. This is his, uh, this, this figure is taken from Ziff's editorial about this experiment that was published in Nature Neuroscience just six months ago uh, by another uh, laboratory. So there seems to be a way in which, as I alluded to earlier, these traits are transmitted across generations. So here, the three distinct sorts of ideas we've been considering. First, social factors can regulate our genes. Second, this regulation is long-lasting in the lifetime of the organism. And third, these effects may even be transmitted across generations. And there's a huge amount of research that's being done right now on this topic uh, in animal models. And to the extent we can understand it uh, in human uh, examples as well. Is that clear? Isn't that cool? I think it's very cool. Um, OK. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, what's your name again? Bernie. Bernie, yes. Yes, they're already misogynist. That's why they work with female children. Yeah, so you're saying. But what you can find is, is you can find that actually there's a correlation between all kinds of outcomes uh, and the proportion of boy versus girls that's sort of, I don't know, somewhat linear. So the more and more boys to girls you have, the more and more they tend to evince these things. You're absolutely right. There could be other things going on, like we've been talking about in the course. And you can't do experiments to be certain of the causation. But yeah, that's right. That's a good question. Yeah, what's your name? Nick. Nick, yeah. So let's say during this evolution that's ratio when you're developing it and you move from one area that's highly unequal, basically men may be, and then go to the area um, so I This is what you would wish you could do in high school, I'm gathering. <laughs> <laughs> It depends. It, in that type of a thought experiment, I suppose it would be some kind of integrated sum of the total exposure. So, you know, if, you have, if the critical window is two years and you spend half that period with all men and half that period with all women, you know, maybe it would average out. Or maybe it depends on which one's first. Or maybe it's weighted. You know, the first half of the two-year window is more important than the second half, et cetera. But it would be, I would predict, some intermediate state. You know, your, your body doesn't day to day, day detect these things. It's sort of across time, uh, presumably these things. I suppose they could do experiments like that with rats actually sort of quantify, and I'm sure they have now that I think about it, the extent of the exposure. Did I answer your question? Yeah, what's your question? Um, what's your name, first of all? Oh, Sarija. Sarija, Sarija, yes. Um, what, like, what does the research show about like, We don't know when those critical periods are, and we don't know for what. So for example, one of the things that I wonder is, think about this crazy idea. We spent all this money on Head Start, which is for three to five year olds. And we believe that it has some impact. In fact, Head Start was invented at Yale, the Yale Child Study Center. Well, what if, uh, in addition to any other effects Head Start has, it may be having some biological effects on developing brains in these little kids, but what if, 
uh, actually, if you can, if you can take the same resources and treat twice as many kids, but only do it for half the time. So instead of treating 100,000 kids from age three to five, you treat 200,000 kids from age three to four, or 200,000 kids from age four to five. If you knew when the critical period was, you could reshape public policy to throw all your resources to get a quasi-permanent impact for twice as many kids if you could really refine not only what the mechanism is, but where the critical period is. Do you see what I'm saying? And, but maybe the critical period for learning reading might be different than the critical period for feeding. Maybe what really matters is the nutrition that we give kids from age one to two, that if we really take care of their nutritional needs then, then they have healthier bodies for the rest of their lives. And obviously, if we starve people afterwards, that's terrible too. But at least, you know, the, the impact of starvation is especially severe because it marks you for the rest of your life if you're exposed to starvation from one to two, but not. Like if I go through a period of, actually be great if I go through a period of three months of starvation, but if I go through a period of three months of starvation, it doesn't have much impact on, my, on the kind of body I have for the rest of my life. But, you know, if you're two, it can mark you for the rest of your life as a plane. So to answer your question, we know that there are just general critical periods that have to do with early, you know, age zero to five, let's say, and, and then puberty, uh, but we don't know exactly when they start or finish, and we presume that they start or finish differently for different exposures. Does that make sense? So if I expose you to violence, like if, if you put me in Afghanistan for a year, you know, and I return to this country, you know, I may, I, uh, well, if I was a, a soldier, I would have other sort of PTSD and other sort of issues. But let's just you imagine the exotic you pick me up and you move me to Afghanistan and I somehow live there for a year without being killed, and I come back, it's not going to have the same impact on my body than if I'm a little four-year-old running around with bombs constantly falling, my relatives being killed. You know, I, I grew up with a different body. Now I'm going to be like the rat that's vigilant uh, at all times for, you know, what is a dangerous environment. Yeah, other questions? Okay, so, um, so the social and biological environments may be in communication within our bodies and not just across evolutionary time, as we saw the last time when we talked about gene culture coevolution. For example, as shown in this figure. So the idea is, is that the environment contributes to you having some kind of body. When you have some kind of body, it leads you to have been some kind of behavior. And here they're using the, uh, the example of RNA silencing, but just assume it's methylation or acetylation. Uh, and that, that, that impact on the RNA has some effect on the kind of body you have in time too. This body is exposed to environment two. Environment two then works upon this body and leads to behavior two and to RNA two, or body or biology two, which then goes to period three and leads to body three, which interacts with environment three and so forth. So back and forth, back and forth, our bodies are in communication with the social environment. Each inter, you know, like there's a kind of dialectic, uh, a kind of uh, conversation that they're having with each other, each interpenetrating and affecting uh, the other. And, 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 uh, and those RNA, in this case, uh, transcriptional dynamics may alter molecular characteristics of, of cells involved in, in the environmental perception or response that result in functionally altered body at the second time period and so forth. Uh, and so on. So because gene transcription serves as both a cause of social behavior by shaping the body and a consequence of social behavior, because it's a product of the environment of the, of, the, of the body, we can see RNA, for example, is constituting the physical medium for a recursive developmental trajectory that integrates genetic characteristics and historical environmental regulators to understand individual biological and behavioral responses to current environmental conditions. And this is taken, I think, yeah, from your readings from today. So there's this incredible, I mean, just, it's just an amazing natural phenomenon out there in the world, which is that our bodies are in, our, our DNA is in conversation with our social environment, back and forth, back and forth, within our lifetimes and across evolution in ways that we're just, science is just beginning uh, to unravel. And I'm going to just close uh, with uh, just a little, some remarks about one other idea that was introduced and is a kind of way of thinking about some of these things, or an example of some of these things that was introduced uh, in the readings for today, where, where it was uh, in the sort of the area of social genomics, the readings talked about conserved transcriptional response to adversity. So there's a way in which we evolved over time to have a response to adversity. How do we respond when there's an adverse, how should our body respond 
uh, to adversity. And the CTRA is a physiologic response, for example, in which white blood cells have alteration in gene expression, which is optimal to deal with different types of microbial exposures in dangerous environments that have been historically been associated uh, with injury. And so the CTRA is a pro-inflammatory skewing of leukocyte basal transcriptome. So it's a way in which we respond. The white blood cells in our body preferentially transcribe the transcriptome, which leads to different levels of proteins. Oh, we better have more of this protein and less of this protein by changing how the genes are expressed in response to the adversity that we are facing. Uh, and it's adaptive in response to physical threats, given that such threats were historically associated with increased risks for wounding and bacterial infection. So in the olden days, you know, we could, uh, we could be, you know, face the saber-toothed tiger or one of our colleagues that was trying to shoot us with an arrow. Uh, we could see that with our brains or experiencing, experience it, and through a diverse set of pathways, the leukocyte conserved transcript transcriptional response to adversity, the CTRA, some genes are upregulated. Each of these is some kind of a gene or a protein expression. Others are downregulated. And as a result, this results in different kinds of bodies to cope with the fact that we might face this environment. Antimicrobial response and wound repair is affected uh, in this old scenario. But in the modern scenario, modern social, symbolic, and imagined threats are totally different. You know, traffic jams, your, uh, your boss yelling at you, I don't know, the mean girls or something, uh, you know, aging. And, uh, and as a result of that, you might activate the same CTRA because it's conserved. That's the body you were equipped with because of evolution. But now, instead of, uh, it may also affect antimicrobial response, but as we discussed earlier in the course, it might lead to inflammation-related diseases of different kinds by activating things, but then not giving them an outlet. You're not actually dealing with wounds or infection. So instead, you, you, uh, you have these types of pathophysiologic uh, uh, effects. That is to say, it's maladaptive in the current environment. Now, because the CTRA can be activated by an imagined social threat, for example, in the absence of an actual physical threat, chronic activation of the CTRA can occur, which promotes the development of several inflammation-related conditions, including cardiovascular disease, depression, metabolic syndrome, neurodegenerative disorders, and certain cancers as well. And these psychiatric and physical conditions cause substantial morbidity and dominate modern mortality. So when you have a body, uh, now in cross evolutionary time, that was shaped to be able to respond, for instance, in our white blood cells with the CTRA in a particular way, and, but now we don't have those types of threats. We have different threats, and for the current era, that kind of body is not uh, so great. And here is how human social signal, trans uh, social signal transduction might work illustrated with respect to white blood cells in the CTRA uh, setting. And this is the process by which subjectively perceived social conditions and historically and developmentally derived anticipatory worries alter genome-wide transcriptional dynamics. So for example, on the left-hand side, what we see is that social environmental threats are neurocognitively apprised and converted into changing patterns of activity in the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis which all of you surely learned about in high school biology, and half of you have already forgotten. The other half are pre-meds and are stressing about this right now. Uh, and so, but the bottom, bottom line is things happen in your brain when you see bad things, and then those things that happen in your brain then reach out and touch your body in all kinds of ways. That didn't come out right, but anyway, that, that, uh, that affect your body in all kinds of ways by, for example, the sympathetic nervous system or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And various sorts of neuroeffector molecules from these systems engage specific gene transcriptional programs in different targeting cells. For example, in leukocytes, uh, the SNS, the sympathetic nervous system, and the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppress innate antiviral genes, and, uh, but activate uh, or inhibit various pro-inflammatory cytokine genes of different sorts. So the idea is that, you know, here's an eviction notice, or a uh, divorce decree, or uh, whatever other kinds of threats are. Here's a, poor performance on an exam, maybe, or something like that, a proverbial panic uh, during a math test. And, uh, and this results in certain uh, processes in the brain being activated. You get hormonal and neuronal processes that feed back onto the cells. These processes then at the level of the cell membrane in different sorts of ways, which you can learn in other courses, or I could spend an hour teaching you, I'm not going to, uh, go into the bloodstream, penetrate the nucleus, and then mark the nucleus in certain ways, and up and down regulate different sorts of things. 
And now on the right, what we can show is that actually that type of a process sets up uh, these processes can also be depicted conceptually, highlighting the fact that social experiences can become biologically embedded, biologically embedded in at least two ways. And first of all, there can be a kind of internal physiologic recursion shown on the left. Uh, and that given that the genes targeted by social signal transduction pathways encode the molecules that mediate social signal transduction, so you see something, you experience something social, and then that social thing that you see changes the way your body responds to social things. So you can kind of have a social recursion. So for example, those of you that think that your friends don't like you, maybe then you begin to act in a way that makes your friends not like you, which then reconfirms that your friends don't like you, and you get a kind of body that progressively evolves to be the kind of body that's not optimal for making friends. And you get a kind of social recursion uh, in this uh, type of a way. This recursive process takes place when conspecifics in the surrounding environment change their behavior in response to an individual's altered actions, locking the individuals in a reciprocal feedback system. And these two pathways give social, I'm sorry, and that's, that's I'm sorry, that was, that was external social recursion that I just described but you can also have internal uh, physiologic recursion. So you have a social environment that leads to different sorts of changes in your body. These can feedback and reshape your body. And then also you can have an external social recursion where you have a social environment, you admit some behavior, or rather it changes your threat perception. You admit some behavior, you become, let's say, paranoid. Because you become paranoid, it results in different changes in your social environment. And you have a kind of external social recursion, which is now running in parallel to an internal physiologic uh, recursion. Again, our bodies are in conversation with our social environment, both physically, biologically, and uh, socially. So to recap, here is how exogenous control of human gene expression by, say, stress might work. So you have extracellular signals of different kinds from the endocrine system, for example, that bond to receptors on the cell surface, that result in different sorts of intracellular changes, that, for example, might tag different kinds of promoter regions, which result in the different sorts of mRNA and coding and, and transcription of the genes, which result in more protein, which then could go out in principle and affect uh, human health and behavior. And this is taken from your readings, this uh, Stavich and Cole reading, which is particularly clear. Actually, the other one, the AGPH one, is uh, particularly uh, clear. So social environmental conditions, including our subjective perceptions of those conditions, can reach deep inside our bodies and affect um, and, and, uh, and to regulate the expression of broad sets uh, of genes. And receptors on the surface of cells can receive these signals from endocrine and sympathetic nervous system, which of course are responding to the social experiences in the kind of biological way that is shown here. So, this is my action, I'm going to finish early today. In the field of biosocial science, a crucial, uh, so, so this field of biosocial science, a crucial and challenging topic of research in the coming years is going to be this. How and why does the social become biological? How and why do cultural and social forces reshape uh, our genome over our lifetime and over evolution? And why are these questions both hard and important? So they're hard and important because they're very technically demanding. The kind of scientific expertise that's required to address these questions typically requires laboratories that have a mix of social and natural scientists, that have a mix of people who can understand these different domains, and people who are willing to consider that the social and the biological might be interconnected. They are, they are difficult and important because they occur at multiple levels, as we've been seeing today and yesterday and the last time. So these types of processes, this conversation between the biological and, so, and social, occurs at so many different levels, within our bodies and across time. Because the causation is bidirectional. The biological can cause the social, and the social can cause the biological. We can have gene culture coevolution. We can have internal and external physiologic and social recursion. We have a kind of way in which these things are happening constantly and in a kind of feedback loop. And finally, because they're morally fraught. A lot of the things that I've discussed today immediately raise all kinds of dicey questions, whether we're talking about abuse or abortion or intergenerational inter transmission of disadvantage or sex or all of these topics, right? These, these ways that our bodies are in the world carry with them kind of moral dimensions. And this, is, this sort of moral component is a key idea that I'm going to be discussing in the next three lectures, finishing with the last lecture. 
beginning to open up and think about what are the moral implications for everything that we've been discussing the last, the rest of the semester, and the policy implications of these ideas about how the biological and the social intersect. Because actually I think that human virtues that sustain our sociality, or that relate to our propensity to be just, or to cooperate, might even be involved in a sort of large-scale feedback loop such that we come to internalize the social world around us deep in our genes. That actually as we create more just worlds, we reshape the kind of bodies equipping us to cope and be in more just worlds, which then in turn leads us to create more and more just worlds. I actually think some of these ideas lie at the root of the long-term evolution of our species, which is generally, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice, as Martin Luther King said. I think the arc of evolution bends towards goodness. And actually, if you look at some of the work that, for example, Stephen Pinker's book recently, Our Better Angels, he's making a similar argument about the decline of violence across 10,000, across 1,000, across 100 years. Because maybe these virtues and other features of social organization determine our genes at least as much as our genes determine them. All right, are there any questions before I let you go today? Please don't start packing up because I'm really annoying. Any questions? Yes, what's your name? Uh, Teddy. Teddy. Is there any, um, is there any way to like increase stress response to beneficially affect your epigenetic regulation? Yes, if you're in a war zone, or if you're in an area where there's high threat, that's the kind of body you want. You want to be like very hypervigilant and very, you know, jittery. Uh, and you know, I think one of the one of the treats I didn't go into this today and. I don't, I don't know enough about it to really teach you anything about it, but if I had to guess, I'm certain that one of the reasons soldiers returning from battle, these are young men typically, and women after all, who are you know, just barely out of puberty, I am sure that they are changing their bodies in quasi-permanent ways. So this PTSD that we see in people returning from battle or war zones or people experiencing battle isn't uh, just social or psychological. I think it is changing the kind of bodies that they have, which then prepares them. You know the, the stories you hear about the guy that's very jittery, like every little boom, like a shutting door, he thinks it's like a grenade going off and then he kills people as a result or something, uh, you know, because he's like so jacked. Well, I think, uh, I think that actually is, is partly biological. It's not just some other kind of process that's happening. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yes, I, Eric? No, what's your name? Ike. Um, so in the um, experiment with the licking the rat, did they, um, like, did they try to undo that behavior somehow throughout the course of life? How did they kind yeah, of that's, so how, how, how did that that's a great question. So they, um, they, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, this is really wild. There is a, um, a drug you can give, um, uh, I'm blocking on the name of the drug right now, it's right on the tip of my tongue. A drug you can give that strips the methyl groups off the DNA, and actually you can reverse the uh, maternal neglect. So if you give the rats this, the, that have been subjected to low licking grooming this drug, you can reverse the effect of being, and that raises all kinds of really creepy considerations. Like maybe in humans, we could magically reverse the impact of being raised in poverty, maybe at age six. And, so, and the reason it's creepy, well, it's creepy on several levels, but one of the reasons it's creepy is that it could also really weirdly lead to, well, who cares if the kids are abused you know, when they're six? We just give them this drug afterwards and it'll kind of restore their bodies in some way. But yeah, so people have done all kinds of clever experiments. There was a question up front here. Gianna, was it you? Yeah. It's okay, what is it? Yes. Um, I think a number of things happen with Navy SEALs. Um, I think it's partly selection. The guys that they recruit to do it have different bodies to begin with, or differently able. And I think the kind of training and support that they get is rather different uh, than the sort of the infantry man, the typical infantry man. Could you extend that? Like, 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 well, I mean, the argument there would be that somehow we should, yes, I suppose it was, sort of, maybe that idea is a little related to the point I made earlier about like Head Start, for example, you know, maybe we could go into, or, or the cigarette taxation, maybe we need to go into communities where people and identify, I mean, this is Gattaca kind of idea, you know, identify people that are especially at risk genetically for being harmed by the environment and remove them from the environment, but leave everyone else in it. 
uh, you know, I think that's what the Navy, part of what explains, I think, the success of the Navy SEALs uh, is that. I mean, they're very, I, I forgot what the ratio of applicants to admittees is, but it's, it's very high. That is to say, it's, it's like, I think actually it's almost as difficult as becoming a Yale. I mean, I think the rates of admission, you know, are tiny. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. I don't know the answer to that in humans, and I, I don't. I think those experiments are being actively done in rats. I, I don't think anyone has tried anything like this in humans. But yeah, with the rats, you can give them these drugs, which you know I don't, you know, have unspecified effects. They've also done them with histone acetylation, so that you can actually have uh, um, inhibitors of acetylation, and then you expose the rats to the to the thing that previously was leading to the epigenetic control or not, and then you can again find the kinds of effects. Lots of beautiful experiments have been done. Actually, I need to add some for next year. Anything else? Yeah, Catherine? One of the arguments you made was that it was <coughs> adaptive for humans to be able to be in conversation with their environment. In this for way. all that animals, too, yeah. But can you explain again why that is the case? Because something like if, if you're exposed to poverty when you're a baby and then you can't change that for the rest of your life, that would seem to be maladaptive. So, yeah. Um, Okay, so first of all, the, the, on the first part of your question, the general claim, I don't think it should be too controversial, at least on the theoretical level, which is that, that animals should have the capacity to change their bodies in response to the kind of environment that they're in. That makes sense that people have evolved the capacity to do that, that all animals have evolved the capacity. The latter case, it's only maladaptive if the environment is changing too fast. So if, in fact, you're born into a world of food scarcity, and or remember, your body is it, it moves with, uh, unitarily in time. So when you're four, we have to decide what kind, how big you're going to be for the rest of your life. You only get one chance to be big. Like I can't like have you, you know, like you, if I say there's not enough food, so be short, uh, have a smaller body, and then I can't then later on say, okay, now there's plenty of food, be tall again. You only have one chance to be tall or short, let's say. See what I mean so far? So your body is going to mature, it's going to evolve from a little baby to a, a, a grown up person, and you go in one direction. And at each step of the way, some decisions have to be made about what's the best, most likely kind of body you're going to need in the future. And so you make that decision with what you see today. You can't necessarily be forward you know, looking. You can't at the age of four know, well, actually, right now there's no food. But when I'm 30, there's going to be food. Therefore, I'm going to have a different kind of body now. So you respond to the body, the environment you have now. And then that marks you because you commit to the decision. This is a two inch for more body, but you get the idea. You commit to the decision of what kind of body you're going to have today, and then you're stuck with it when you're 40. Now, in the meantime, when you're 40, plentiful food again, but it's too late. You acquired this body when you were four when there wasn't much food. So that's that's the idea. We don't we uh, we can't go back and undo development. You know, the body doesn't work that way. So so we, we haven't evolved. Now maybe there are some animals that you know every month can have a different you know maybe animals with higher generation like salamanders that you cut off their limbs. But at least in mammals, that's not that's not the way development works. All right, so that's it for today. See you.